Good morning and welcome to worship. Whatever time of day you are actually joining the service, we hope you find it helpful and meaningful and it enables you to worship God. Please leave us a comment if you wish to let us know you have listened or contact the interim moderator, that's myself, Reverend Anne McAllister, on 01560 483191 if you would like more information about St Kentigern's. We have some intimations. In order to facilitate our opening for worship, St Kentigern's wished to employ a cleaner initially to work for three hours on a Monday, although that may increase by agreement. For further details, contact Ian Rennie, 01563 538. 932. Details are also on the website. Ian's Bible study will start again on the 15th of September and again contact Ian for arrangements. The Kirk session met on Tuesday and decided to open for an hour for private prayer on Wednesday the 16th of September between 2 and 3 and to open for Sunday worship on Sunday the 27th of September at the usual time of 11am. There will be a booking system for both events and strict instructions for entry, exit and hygiene arrangements. We will announce these nearer the time and they will also be on the website. We hope to see some of you there but also understand if you have been shielding that it is not appropriate for you to come and if you are in the vulnerable category over 70 or with an underlying health condition you may prefer not to come. There is a diagnostic test available on the website to assess your risk factor. We hope to provide an internet service as at present for a few weeks after we open. So let us join together to worship God in Mission Praise 1000, King of Kings, Majesty.
Hello, it's good to be back with you again today. Now, I've come out into my garden today because I've been back at work and I've been inside most of today. So I thought I would come out to enjoy just the last little bit of the sun this evening. I know that you've now been back at school for a couple of weeks now. And I know that it's just a little bit different from what it was like before. But I think you're probably glad to be back. You'd be glad to be back to see your friends and glad to be back to doing something that feels a bit more normal for you. And you're probably glad to be back to be out every day rather than being stuck inside. Today, I've got a few different things for us to think about. Now, I know I can't get answers from you, but I'm wanting you to think about some answers in your head. So I'm going to give you some clues to see whether you can guess what I'm talking about. And some of them are easier than others. The first thing I'm thinking about has four legs. Now, I don't think that's enough of a clue to go on. There's not enough there to help you decide what that could be. So I'm going to give you another clue. We quite often find it in our garden. So there's two clues. Now, I don't know if that's still enough for you to make a decision, because making decisions on these things are quite hard. I'm going to give you another clue now. It's got fur. Hmm. I wonder if by now you've guessed what it is, or whether you're still thinking you need another clue. So I'm going to tell you another clue. And the last clue is, it likes to go for walks. Now, none of those clues on their own would probably help you make the decision. But when you put them together, you probably know what it is. And the answer to this one is a dog. But if I just told you the thing had fur, you wouldn't have known what that was. Because it could have been a dog, or a cat, or a rabbit. There's no way of deciding that it's a dog just from one clue. So for us to make decisions, we have to have enough to go on. I'm going to give you another set of clues now. And I wonder if you can get these. So this is something you can eat. Now you're probably saying that could be anything. It's something sweet to eat. There's still a lot of choices from that. It could be a lot of different things. So I'm going to give you another clue to help you decide what it is. It's usually wrapped in purple. Now, that could still be quite difficult to think about. So I'm going to give you another clue. They generally come in circle shapes. Now, I wonder how many of you can guess what it is. I've got them here. Chocolate buttons. Now you can't. Other makers are available out there. But I brought these Cadbury's ones. So the only way you could make the decisions was to have all of the evidence, all of the clues to help you get your answers. Because if I'd stopped after saying it was wrapped in purple and it was tasty and it was something you could eat, you might have thought it was a bar of chocolate. Or you might have thought it was something else entirely. So we need to have all these things to help us make our decisions to help us decide what the answer could be. Now, sometimes Jesus did this. He told stories and then he asked questions at the end of it. And that was to help his followers make their own minds up, make their own decisions, decide what they wanted to do. So sometimes he would say things like, in this story I've just told you, who was a neighbour? Or, who did the right thing? Because, you know, we have decisions we have to make every day. Now, it could be decisions like whether you want to eat the bar of chocolate or the chocolate buttons. It could be a bigger decision, like how you're going to behave at school. It could be a big decision about how you're going to answer your mum and dad when they shout for you. 
it could be a big decision. Like, who is going to be a friend? And these are all things we have to decide on ourselves. Sometimes making decisions can be really hard. Which is why Jesus encourages us to look at all the facts, to look and think about what's been put in front of us before we make big decisions. Because Jesus wants us to decide if we want to be his friend. He doesn't say, this is what you should do. He helps us by giving us lots and lots of facts and lots of different ways to make our decisions. It's not going to be easy. And Jesus never said that following him was going to be easy. But he always told us that he will be with us wherever we go. So I wonder if you can look at all the facts and help you make the decision that you want to follow Jesus. Let's say a little prayer about this. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for helping us to make our own decisions, for helping us to make our own minds up. Thank you for being with us as we went back to school and for staying by our sides and keeping us protected. Thank you, Father God, for our families who help us, who guide us, who teach us. Help us to know what the right decisions are, Father God. Help us to look at what's in front of us and decide from the facts and the information we have. Help us to understand that following you can be difficult, but following you can also be fantastic. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Now we're going to sing our next hymn, which will be, Will You Come and Follow Me? I hope you go out this week and make lots of good decisions. Not just simple ones, like whether to have the bar of chocolate or the chocolate buttons, but making good decisions and the correct decisions for you. See you soon. Bye. <laughs> Let us approach our God in prayer.
let us pray. Almighty God, who reaches out to meet us where we are, we worship you. All-seeing God, who knows our every thought, word and action, we worship you. All-loving God, who loves us as we are and longs to see us change, we worship you. Lord, we recognise that our world does not yet follow your ways. We realise that your way of being is very different to ours, for even the best of us can be blinkered or selfish or judgmental. We would be more like you, for we know that your way of love is the right way. Yet we find it difficult to love our enemies. We would rather be comfortable with good food to eat than simply have adequate so that others can eat something. We would prefer things to be done our way than yield to someone else's ideas. Yet you turn all that round. As Jesus, you loved the enemies you had on this earth and asked that they be forgiven. You gave up a secure way of life to be a nomad with no home. You obeyed the will of the Father, even though that had such awful consequences for you, pain and death. Lord, we recognise your ways will turn our world upside down once every knee bows to you, and we long for that to happen. We worship you as the wonderful being of love and grace that you are. Thank you for giving us a way to enter your amazing kingdom. Help each one of us to change. Bring to our minds just now the wrong things we have done, that we might confess them to you and learn how to change. Hear each of us as we speak to you in the quietness. Hear us now as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. John will now read our Bible passage for us. Listen for the word of God. Hello everyone. The reading this morning is at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. That's Matthew chapter 16, Verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son is man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death 
before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may these words enable your word to be heard in our hearts today. Amen. Last week, you may remember, we spoke about names, how important they are to identify someone, reminding us of the person behind the name. We spoke particularly about how Peter named Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, and how that was a huge step forward. Jesus was no longer simply Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. He was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at least to Peter and increasingly to the other disciples. We spoke too about the expectations in a name and how we sometimes put our own expectations, right or wrong, on the person behind the name. In today's reading, we learn that Peter had wrong expectations of Jesus. Peter had not mentioned anything about saving the Jews from the Romans or about politics. But even at that, his expectations were not right. Not only was this a turning point in how the disciples saw Jesus, it was a turning in point, a turning point in how Jesus treated them. Up to now, he had taught mostly to crowds of people who came to hear him talk about God and teach about him and see him heal. Now Jesus was turning his attention to the disciples. The time was coming when he would have to leave them and they would be tested beyond anything they imagined without him to protect them. Jesus needed to prepare them, so they needed to know what was going to happen. He had already dropped hints that his ministry would not have the ending they might expect. And here we find him telling them plainly that he would go to Jerusalem as they expected, but not to win a victory of the kind they longed for, but to suffer to be ill-treated, even to die. He also added that he would rise again, but interestingly, Peter does not mention that. Probably he was so overcome by the bad news that he stopped listening. How often have we done that? We hear the beginning and don't listen to the end. That is one reason you should always have someone with you when you go to see a consultant for important results. If he does give you bad news, you may not take in whatever else he says. Or it could be the idea of Jesus rising again was just too far-fetched for Peter to take it in. Jesus had been very wise in his approach to his ministry. If he had appeared on the religious scene, claiming to be the Messiah at the beginning, he would probably have been laughed out of court. Certainly few would have believed. And he had proved himself first. He had shown by his knowledge, his wisdom and his healing power that he was very special. <coughs> until some people at least realised for themselves who he was. Now that they had realised, and with time running out, Jesus had to move them on, and he had to trust they were ready for that. But Peter wasn't. He was expecting that Jesus would lead them to Jerusalem, where he would win a victory over the religious leaders, maybe not in battle, but by teaching and the force of his personality, and that he would be acclaimed as the Messiah. He took Jesus to task. He admonished him. Whatever the translation says, the very thought of telling God he is wrong 
is just startling. But that's Peter for you. Just say what you think. This time he must have wished he had thought first. Get you behind me, Satan, says Jesus. What an awful thing to hear your Messiah say to you. You can imagine Peter standing there open-mouthed, scarcely believing that he has heard that. And then realising how much he has angered Jesus and the tears coming to his eyes. Jesus is saying to Peter and to us, don't try to soft soap the message. This is what will happen. To give false hope, to dilute the warning, is to act for Satan. If we are tempted to persuade someone to take the easy way, to look after number one, whatever it may be that is not God's way, we are acting for Satan. So, Having admonished Peter severely in order to make his point, for Peter needs to get things right if he is to be the leader, Jesus goes on to make it even clearer to them all. Following him will not be easy. There are no half measures. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For some of them, that would mean literally taking up a cross and being crucified. But for all, it meant giving up a great deal. He must deny himself. If you want to follow Jesus, you must hand over control of your life to him. You must go where he wants you to go. Take on the task he may give you. It won't be easy to follow Jesus. It could be quite a challenge. How does that sound to you? Are you backing off or rising to the challenge? Do you feel like retreating back into your shell of known security? Or are you willing to put your trust in a man who turned out to be God and who proved himself the most loving, amazing person they had ever lived. Jesus goes on to be even more enigmatic. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If you want to retreat into your old ways, the ways of the world, you will lose your life. Of course, we will all die, so that might seem a silly thing to say. But Jesus is saying, you will lose eternal life. You will die completely, forever. If, on the other hand, you are willing to give up your life to him and follow where he leads, then you will have eternal life. Jesus goes on to illustrate that. He reminds us, that we could have everything in the world we thought we wanted, but we might lose our soul to Satan. We would not have followed God, and so we would not enter his kingdom. If we realise that at the end of our life, how could we buy back what we had lost? All our money would not be enough. This is the beginning of Jesus turning the world upside down. He has smashed the disciples' expectations of their Messiah. He goes to Jerusalem not to win ascendancy over the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law, but to apparently be defeated by them. But then there's that strange bit about rising again. And he's saying that earthly goals and values are not right. They are of man, not God. Is it not natural and commendable to try to be as successful as you can in life, to get a good income, provide well for your family, enjoy the good things, have power? 
No, says Jesus. You shouldn't expect an easy, comfortable life, but a hard one in which you go where he sends. If you have a choice between a good, well-paid job and a just adequately paid job for a charity, which do you choose? If you have a wee bit extra one week, should you go out and buy yourself a wee treat or help someone else out? If you can stay at home in familiar surroundings or go abroad to do mission work, using your skills for people who have little, perhaps living as they live while you do it, which will Jesus ask you to do? Would you do as he asks? Maybe. Have we not been discovering some of these dilemmas during lockdown and often discovering too the joy of doing things God's way? I have had two conversations with young men recently in which they both commented how much good there is in the world shown up in this time of difficulty. And we've discovered people looking for Jesus by attending services online, looking for help or solutions or comfort or whatever, but exploring and investigating to try to find a way through the pandemic. Sometimes it's the hard times that change the world. At the end of our reading, we find Jesus reminding them that the Son of Man will return. And he puts this so nicely. He will reward each person according to what he has done. He's not using the term judge here. Maybe he feels he has given them a hard enough time. His statement sounds so encouraging. But of course, behind it is the warning that those who have not done well will receive the reward that is due to that too. Finally, finally he emphasised his very difficult talk by telling them that he will prove what he says to be true by giving them the promise that they will see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. And of course they do, except for Judas, because Jesus does rise and appear before them in a new body. Today we are his hands and feet, his voice and his touch. We have the job he started of turning the world upside down, spreading his word and his ways until he can return once again to a kingdom which is wholly his. Will you help turn the world upside down? Amen. John is going to offer our prayer for others. But first, let us ask God to hear our prayers. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give of our time, our talents and treasure in faith and hope 
We hope that you can use these gifts and hope that they can further your kingdom here on earth. Father, you call on us to come to you with our prayers for others. And we do this in a spirit of gratitude for all the ways your infinite grace and mercy fill our lives. We thank you for your creation and for all the blessings of this life. And most of all, for your love revealed to us through the gospel and ministry of Jesus. Let us always be aware of your mercy. Remind us to take time to understand your grace, to make us aware of your presence in all we do. Listening God through Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to ask for blessings for ourselves and others in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will, even when your will is unexpected or unclear to us. You are the source and goal of it all. You made us and we pray for all that you have made, that we may do what's right, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness might be fed, and that all your children might equally enjoy the fruits of your creation. Father, we remember and praise, pray for all those who are suffering from the coronavirus, for those who fear for themselves or their loved ones. Be with them whether in our community or throughout the world, and grant them peace and healing. We pray for the church, that we keep and increase our faith and service so that your good news might be broadcast in our community and beyond, so that your love and light may be a beacon of hope and purpose in the darkest places. We cannot love you fully unless we love our neighbour as ourselves, so we pray for our enemies and our friends. We pray for all those in need, in body, mind and spirit, especially those who are known to us personally, and for all those who need your healing hand. Father, bless us and those we love, and hear us as we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now after the blessing we will have our closing music that's from Songs of God's People. It's number 84, O Lord, of all the world. And now the blessing. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. <laughs>
Say.